so um, I'm not really talking per se about Mary Magdalene, but I think it's got a lot to do with, uh, especially what you just said last about um, the witches being burned at stake and being denounced by their neighbours, mm. um, which is, I've started um, working with young women and working to get them to work together, so I think it's really important after all that happening, after women denouncing other women, to really then on the other side bring, start bringing women together and saying actually we should be working together and we should be um, supporting each other and not denouncing each other. So three years ago I started university in Bath, um, doing education and psychology and I managed to get through two years before I was like this is enough, it's not fulfilling the other side of me, what you were saying, it's everything's so academic and when actually you've grown up in this area and you've got all this going on, to go into an academic field and not have the other side at the same time, it's very difficult. So I took a year out and I set up girl circles, um, which is where we meet um, a group of five or six young girls and two women facilitators. And we just open up a space for these girls to support each other and um, to learn, learn about menstruation. Because these are young girls who haven't quite reached their first period, haven't quite reached their mark. So just opening up the space for these young girls to really create strong friendships and, and um, these important bonds. And so I was doing this for, for the year after the university. And um, when I decided to go back to university afterwards, I thought it would be really amazing if I could do some academic research on what I've just witnessed throughout the year of all the amazing changes that I was watching in these young girls. And I wanted to actually say, well, I can prove this academically. I can show this academically what I've just witnessed. Because these girls, were their relationship with menstruation was changing and their relationship with each other was changing and they were building a support group and they weren't afraid to ask questions and they weren't afraid to, they weren't afraid of this whole process that often is very secretive and often nobody talks about. So the name of my, my work, my dissertation is called The Perceived Effect of Social Support on Young Girls' Experiences in Menstruation. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I was more interested in not what I saw as the effect, but what the young girls themselves, the effect that they really felt. So I did two study, well, one study group with two groups of girls. I did young girls, 11 to 12 year old girls, that I had worked with in circle um, in Bath. And then I did the older girls, um, about 17 to 18 year olds, who had never had any, um, like, circle, this type of support, but speaking to them about the support that they have had. So I got the young girls to fill out questionnaires um, about different ways they feel about menstruation in different situations. So at school, do you feel embarrassed? Do you feel like you can talk? Where's the, mo the safest place you feel to talk about anything? And Practically all these girls said that in circle was the safest place they felt, or at home on their own with their mother. And the older girls said that school was just such a stressful time, and they didn't know what was going on, and they had so many unanswered questions. And these younger girls who had only literally just started, or many who hadn't even started yet, were already ahead of these 17, 18 year old girls who had been menstruating for five years five or six years, and they were already ahead of these girls, they already felt more confident, they already had more knowledge about the process, whereas these girls have actually experienced it for a, a, a good amount of time. So there's actually lots of research on social support, which can be broken up into different categories, so emotional support, practical and informational. And so I was more interested in the emotional support. But actually, what the girls brought up was they really needed the practical and the informational support as well. And what they needed was it both to be together. 
the, the, they need to receive information or support and practical support together. So they needed to learn about everything that they needed to do, but in a space that they felt safe, and a space that they felt emotionally supported. And so there's a theory of social support that says that when, you're, when um, you feel socially supported, your stress, stress levels are reduced. So I wanted to see how social support can affect the stress levels to do with menstruation, but also wanted to see whether it could have any effect on embarrassment, because I feel like that's a very big, for these young girls, that was a very big thing for them. They were often embarrassed, which is one of the big things that was stopping them from asking questions and helping each other and supporting each other, or even just talking to each other and expressing themselves. And so what I found was that um, when you mix both emotional and practical support, it had like huge effects on their levels of embarrassment and their levels of stress. And so I, I was able to, to use this theory, but just to completely blow it open and, and use it for something that it had never even, nobody would even thought, think about using it to look at menstrual education. Um, and just speaking to the older girls as well, um, it just led on to so many topics that just um, education on your body, it, it affected their entire lives because it, it affects birth control and the way they see their bodies and the way they feel about their bodies and that they were saying that if they just had that extra little bit of support, if they just learned more information, if the, the men that they were next to, the, the young boys, in their classes, knew more information, and then the whole experience would have changed. And this is what I'm starting to see with these young girls, and it'll be interesting if I can go back and speak to these young girls afterwards, and follow some of the girls that I work with in Circle, and see when they're 17, 18, how they compare to the 17, year, 18 year old girls who didn't have any of this, and whether um, maybe they're getting it from other places, a lot of them are getting it from their mothers. But there are lots of young girls without a supporting mother or with an absent mother or who they don't feel like they can talk to. So at one point, the education system needs to come and step in and be like, well, we're educating these girls on everything else, so why aren't we educating them on one of the major parts of their body? And educating them to support each other. So that was yeah, that was my research, and um, I absolutely loved doing it. It was I had so so much support as well, which was one of the major things. Was I had all these women who were willing to help me all over the world, mm -hmm. and unfortunately I could only base it in England because it was a short project and you have to follow certain rules, but I have people in America, so many women in America who were running circles as well and were like, we would love to participate, we would love to help. And just that, just seeing how many women are stepping up and saying, actually this is really important work and we would love to share this work and love to show what, what effect this is having. Bringing all these women together, I think that's one of the big essences of Mary Magdalene's bringing women together and supporting each other and learning from our past mistakes to now do things differently now. So <laughs> I don't have much more to say, I just wanted to... Right, okay, well thank you so much. Thank you. Um, questions, discussion, if you've got some time. Do you think there mm. was, um, so the girls have received more support, do you think that they experienced less painful periods than girls that received those Well, I, I think personally they would, but most of the girls who've received that support haven't yet had their periods, so it would be difficult, I'd have to go back and see and speak to these girls and go back. But I think it would have a big effect on the pain because they would also be learning healthier ways, so what we teach in the circles is um, natural ways to reduce pain and actually a lot of it's to do with the emotional, your emotional link with your period and your diet and all this and if the girls are learning a healthier way, a health, having a healthy relationship with their periods then I do believe that their pain levels would be greatly reduced. Um, but I also kind of, you have
have to be careful with what you tell these girls because one of the girl in one of the circles we said, well, usually your first period, um, it's it's very light. You'll just see light spotting, and it, it won't be that heavy the first time. And then one of the girls' first periods was just very very heavy, and she was like. I'm not normal, what's wrong? So even when you're trying to explain um, things, you've just got to be so careful with what you say because it just everyone is different, everyone's body is different and I think just explaining that everyone's normal and adjusting their relationship with it, I think. For me personally, it's definitely reduced my pain. Um, and I know not to bother women who it has, um, but these are all older women who have worked with it for a lot longer. Um, but it would be great if we could start from the beginning and just get eliminate pain altogether because actually there should be no pain at all because it's it's an actually important function and normally it should be painless. It's like going for a week, if you suddenly have pain going for a week, you're gonna be asking questions and being like, well something's not wrong, something's wrong, something's not right. But we kind of have stopped questioning why we've got pain when we have our periods. Whereas actually, I mean, obviously there should be some discomfort, lots of things happening, but it shouldn't be like this gauge in pain that lots of these young women are feeling. Uh, so I think I hope with more work with them that it would definitely reduce that. Have you studied any teenage practice? And teenage, teenage pregnancy is very, like in French, it is really, really bad. Yeah, well, that they, they used to have it in America as a problem, yeah. but then both women and men, they use protection. Well, but here in France, I just know, I just uh, met a, a young woman who is pregnant. And she's pregnant for the third time, she's 22 years yeah. old. Well, and she takes it out all the time. Oh, I'll take it out. It's yeah. sure that human life. You know? Like abortion. Yeah. yeah, easily, just like this. Well, it's I like did do a, a very short research last year in, one of, in the local lycée with older girls, with 17, 18 year old French girls, and it was about 15 of these girls, and a lot of the questions was on, um, was on um, birth control. Right. And there's very little information here on birth control, and I've had, because I work with female contraception and natural contraception, and I can't tell you how many women have called me up and said, yeah. Tori, I'm pregnant, can you help? Yes, yeah, yes, it's a um, big problem. It's really and it's a big problem, and, and there's nothing really, like, I, I had a friend who fell pregnant on the IUD, on the steroid, um, and you don't know, three months can pass because you're not going to think about it. So, I think, one part of the circles is teaching them um, fertility awareness. Right. So even if they're not using it as their sole method of contraception, just teaching these young girls when they're most fertile and what the consequences are and how your body works, if they keep track on it, then you can know very, very quickly and there's a, I think it's a lot less dangerous doing it mm -hmm. very, very early versus three months into the pregnancy when they decide. But yeah, it's a big, big problem. Hello, so I have two, a kind of question and a comment. Um, I used to be head of sex education in an all boys grammar school <laughs> in Poole, um, as well as religious studies, philosophy, and PSHE, they call it, in British education. Yeah, and they get sex education as part of it. And this was an all boys school. So we did, you know, uh, Various things. Nurses came in and talked about sexually transmitted diseases. There was nothing about love education, which always annoys me. I think there ought to be about responsible love making of sex. You know that would solve the unwanted pregnancies to some extent. Um, but in, in girls' schools or in mixed schools, surely um, this should be part of sex education, is it not? Well, so Why I had. I think two or three girls who were in all girls schools mm -hmm. and they said that it was easier because they could speak um, more freely in their classrooms mm -hmm. but part of my research I found out that sex education in England hadn't been updated since the year 2000 mm -hmm. so we're now to 2019 it's been 19 right. years and we, haven't, we haven't had an update mm -hmm. in the sex education in the UK oh. 
they've only just they've just done it now. Literally, there was a consultation last year, and it's just been updated. So there should be, but even in all girls schools, they were still teaching the same curriculum that they were teaching 19 years ago. Have you seen the updated curriculum? Does it include um, menstrual education? Yes, it, it now includes menstrual education and it includes, it's more on the love, it's more relationships and um, wow. intimacy. Send so me a copy of that. Yeah, yeah but where are all the teachers coming from? Because how, who's going to be teaching this? There's nobody who's qualified at the moment to be teaching this because they can't just overnight teach one thing and then decide, oh, we're going to teach it's this. It's not really the RE teacher, I guess. This yeah, time. but where's, where's she getting the information from? Some, where's she getting the 60 year old yeah. RE teacher that really doesn't I mean, want to be doing this? When I went into the ESA and did my research with the local French girls, mm. I had the school nurse with me. And I knew more about menstruation and sexual education than she did. So it's just, so who is teaching it? Well, I think you, this is a job for you, Tor, isn't it? You? Yeah, but what, <laughs> what, where are the qualifications coming? Like, who's going to decide how you need to be qualified? It's, it's very complicated. Like, I can definitely go in and teach these girls what they need to learn. But who's going to say, yes, you're qualified or no, you're not qualified? That's a bigger that's, that's, discussion about the nature of education. So you and have to be a nurse, and you have to say that you work with a nurse. Yeah, well this is yeah. what I was doing, I was working with a the nurse, they allowed me to come in. Um, but I actually never got, they were going to give me feedback, but I actually never got any feedback. And I do think the nurse was slightly, slightly embarrassed because I knew lots of the things that she didn't. And I was going to her being like, um, are you, like, do you agree with what I'm saying? And she's like, I, I don't really know. I, I've not learned much about this. Mm. Um, well, I hope, I hope you publish your research. Are you going to publish it as a little Well, I think I need to, something? yeah, because at the moment it's a 10,000 word dissertation, so I need to mm. write a journal article style paper out of it, I think, and just yep. put it down to 10 pages. Just what I've said today, basically, because you don't need to read through the whole everything. Right. Um, but I would like to, yes. Yeah, I think um, you, you, I'm, you know, we, we will support you to do that. <laughs> it's important. There are a few people who have published. There's a, um, a charity in England called Plan UK International, and they've just published a, a report called Breaking the Barriers, and it's all about sex education. And they've said a lot about what I've said, but I've just gone deeper into the one specific topic, and they've talked about a whole variety of topics. So there's lots, it's it's getting bigger in the UK at the moment, but yeah. France are really, really behind. Is I also have a comment to make, just to share with the group, um, which is relevant when you were talking. Most people don't know this, but I've just written a book with a scientist who's an embryologist called uh, Richard Dryden. He is a professor of embryology in the UK. He's a descendant of the poet John Dryden. And um, <clears throat> it's called The Book of the Egg. And it's an exchange of essays. He is a philosopher, a religious studies expert, a peace studies expert. And he was a pure scientist. And he's writing articles. And uh, we're discussing what is an egg. What's it made of? Who invented it? Where did it come from? How did it evolve? Why is it important in religious symbolism? Um, and menstruation is about the egg. This is what it's about. And so we talk about that. And in my chapter, I talk about the taboos against menstruation and the fear of it. And a lot of men used to think that women became quite witchy you know, during that period. And they shouldn't be touched. You know, there's all kinds of taboos. And some of them, you know. So this, so anyway, the book of the egg, it'll be published like next year. It was just finishing the essays and things. And it's quite interesting because I put forward in my argument that this, okay, at the root of a lot of ancient religions is a kind of egg worship going on. And it's interesting, Mary Magdalene in icons is shown holding a red egg, the red egg of love. So she is the life force, the egg, if you want. And what I argue in my essays, and of course he's a sort of materialist scientist who shoots everything I say down. And then I come back 
it's going to be a great book, you know, people with both wings. I say the egg is a vehicle created by divine intelligence for the embodiment of spirit in form. That's me as a philosopher speaking. He says, nonsense, you can't talk like that, get away with it. It's just evolved. It's just, I can explain how it works mechanistically, and this bit does that, and that does that, and it's all just random chance. And I say, no, it's a divine wisdom work. So my question to you is like, do you ever get onto the divine wisdom? Part of the discussion. Um, with the young girls, we go into some of it, into intuition and things like that, but about the egg, I do think that there's two important times in your cycle where the egg is very present, and one of them is menstruation, where you can be very creative and tap into the divine feminine. Mm. And we talk a lot about that with the girls, that the, when you are bleeding, that that's a really good time for them to be creative and go within and really, yeah, look after themselves. Mm -hmm. But then also another important time which has got a lot to do with teenage pregnancy mm -hmm. is um, when they're ovulating and when they're having sex. And because lovemaking, mm -hmm. it's usually it's supposed to be to make a baby, so to make a baby from the eggs and creation. Mm -hmm. But you need to teach the, the young people that actually if you're deciding you don't want a baby, that energy is still coming out. The creation energy is still coming out into that egg. So if you're not channeling that creation energy into something else, if you're not doing it consciously with your partner and saying, actually, we're making love, but we're not making love to make a baby. We're making love because we want to create something else together. We want to create this space together. We want to put this energy into something else. And I think that's, I don't know quite how you would talk about that with young people, but I think that's important because that's the whole reason. The egg's there, if, mm. if you're making love at that point in time, the egg's there, it's ready, mm. and if you're putting that energy into it, then you're very likely going to fall pregnant. But if you can put that energy into something else, then I think that's very important. Into the relationship. Well, into the relationship. It's very Gnostic though, isn't it? The it is. The love's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you.